Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for being here and for the opportunity to present as well. Um, especially, John, thank you to you for letting me know about this opportunity. John and I go way back, so it's good to be working with you again today. So today, uh, I'm going to get into a more statistics-heavy talk today. I'm going to talk about Bayesian model selection with my R package that I've written, SLGF. So um, here's some data to look at. And before we start talking, you know, I'm going to describe in a couple minutes what all of this data is and what it all represents. But for, for the time being, let's just think big picture. And I want you to just look at any trends you might see in these data sets. So let's start on the left side of things. So three common data layouts. On the left panel, we have a one-way analysis of variance or ANOVA. So this is one of the first statistical methods that you'll learn about in a data science class or something. We have a categorical independent variable on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis, we have a continuous dependent variable. Um, in the center, we have ANCOVA, which stands for analysis of covariance. This is a scenario where we have one categorical predict predictor, a continuous predictor. So those are our independent variables, one each categorical and continuous. And then on the y-axis, we have our dependent variable, which is also continuous. And then on the right, we have a two-way layout. So we have two categorical dependent variables for that situation and a continuous dependent variable. So we have a broad a range of statistical uh, approaches that we can take with these three data sets. And again, for now, just kind of look at the patterns you see in these, in these plots, and we'll talk in a moment about what these data sets actually are. So what Bayesian model selection is, is uh, if you're not familiar with that, and I, I'm gonna, I enjoyed that talk about the bike share. I'm gonna refer back to that a couple times here because you kind of prefaced a couple of things I wanted to mention here today. First of all, there's always more than one reasonable way to model a data set with a statistical model. A way that you did in the bike share talk was you did uh, a Poisson regression and you did a random forest and you did a linear model. There's more than one way to model your data, but at the end you need to select one of those models and you need to select based on some metric. In the bike share talk, the metric you used looked like it was the root mean squared error, or you did cross-validation prediction error rate. The example I mentioned here is you could select the model with the highest R squared or something. But specifically what Bayesian model selection does is it quantifies the posterior model probability of each of the models that you consider. So you have multiple models under consideration, and then you associate a probability with, with each of those models. And so you can select your model then based on which one seems to be the most probable. So uh, now we'll talk on a little bit more depth about these individual data sets. Is a standard approach going to be satisfactory? Like I said here, analysis of variance ANOVA would be the way that we would start with. Uh, we would typically approach this one. On the x-axis, our independent variable is age category. So we have five categories of ages. And then the response, the dependent variable, is the olfactory acuity. Uh -oh. Let's see the chat pop up. Did I cut out? Oh, it's Sean. I thought my yeah. My don't ignore that. Again. I just want to make sure people know to ask a question. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm conditioned to teaching online this semester. I uh, I get worried when I see the chat blink now. So our condition, our continuous dependent variable is the olfactory acuity on the y-axis. And so the the typical modeling approach to this would be uh, to fit a linear model. So this would be the R syntax. You use the LM function linear model with the olfactory function as the response and your age category as the predictor. You'd get an intercept with four degrees of freedom for the age category, and then you would get one residual standard error for that. But now I want you to think, maybe this model is a little bit too complex. You know, now I wanna talk about why I've color coded these, these levels. For example, look at the red group and the gray group as the color coding is there. It looks like the red group, if you kind of look, all have the same mean. Do I really need to model a distinct mean for each of those levels of the red categories, one, two, and three? Similarly, uh, one of our assumptions for ANOVA is that all the variances are equal. Well, look at these box plots. You can tell that the variances don't look equal. It looks like the gray group has a larger uh, residual error variance than the red group does. So maybe we'd be missing out on something important if we just fit a standard ANOVA model. So this, uh, that middle data set in that plot of three is the ANCOVA, the analysis of covariance situation. The, the independent variables we have here are a starch type with three levels represented by the circle, the triangle, and the diamond points on the plot. So uh, we're taking chips made out of these starches and we put pressure on them until they break. And so we want to determine that Y 
that y-axis there is the dependent variable breaking strength. And then we also have a, an independent continuous predictor, the film thickness, and that's represented on the x-axis. So we wanted to determine how much force do we need to apply to these chips to break them, depending on the thickness of the chip and the type of starch that the chip was made from. And so then that breaking strength is on the y-axis. How would you fit this in R with a linear model? Strength by film plus starch effects. You get a film effect, you get three parallel starch effects, and you get one residual standard error. So if you plotted the model for this, you would get three parallel lines for the three levels of the starch that you have. Again, is this unnecessarily complex? Do we really need three parallel lines? Um, and are they even parallel? If you kind of imagine a line of best fit through the red points, it might kind of go like that. But if you imagine the line of best fit through the gray points, it looks like it is probably not as steep. So I don't know if the red and gray group, the scarlet and gray group, would have the same slopes in this context. Similarly, it looks like the red points would be pretty um, focused near that line of best fit, and the gray points are a little more spread out. Is that assumption of equal error variance is reasonable here? It doesn't look like it to me. And then finally, that third data set was a two-way unreplicated layout. So we do not have a lot of data here. There's only 12 observations in this data set. We have a categorical variable. There are six dogs that were measured here. Each dog had lymphoma. And we took two samples from each dog, one from the normal tissue of the dog and one from the tumor tissue. And we measured on a continuous scale a genomic hybridization signal. So we're measuring some gene signal in each of the two samples from each of the six dogs. And so you would typically fit just a uh, linear model with LM again, with the gene response as a function of the dog and the tissue effects. Uh, you'd get an intercept, you'd get a tissue effect, and you would get five degrees of freedom for the dog effect. Now, if you've taken a stats class or a modeling class like this, you see that those non-parallel lines like that, there's an interaction here, right? Your first inclination statistically here should be to model an interaction because those lines uh, you have two very distinct groups of lines there that intersect. Uh, the problem is with only 12 observations, we don't have enough degrees of freedom to fit a typical interaction. So I think a typical modeling approach would miss something that you can really clearly see. Dogs one, two, and five appear to behave differently than dogs three, four, and six. So what my R package SLGF does is it will unify all these scenarios in each case here. So the common thread through all these data sets is that we have a categorical predictor that I've color coded here with the red and gray that we can divide the levels of that categorical predictor into two groups um, and that those two groups behave differently somehow. We call that the suspected latent grouping factor. So finally, that's what SLGF stands for. Our suspected latent grouping factor is that categorical predictor that appears that somehow we can partition it into two levels that behave and model them differently because they appear to behave differently. So that's what I just mentioned there. We partition the data into two levels based, into two groups rather, based on the levels of that latent grouping factor. So uh, what this poses a problem here just because that is such a broad range of statistical models we could consider then. Uh, we might have the variances differ by group as they do in the ANOVA example up in the top right. Those box plots, those five across, look like the gray group has a larger error variance than the scarlet group. Or we have to consider a context where maybe we have the scarlet group has a different slope than the gray group, as it does in this uh, middle left plot. Or we could have a situation where there's an interaction between the scarlet and the gray groups, as we have in the bottom right. So there's a lot of, we need a lot of flexibility here to account for a lot of different ways that this group effect can manifest itself in the data. So the R package then allows you to specify lots of different model specifications and to specify different error variance specifications in your model. Um, so that's what the R package SLGF does. And so then it'll choose among the best models based on the Bayesian model selection approach that I mentioned a moment ago. So uh, something we have to consider is uh, the set of all the possible models that we can consider. So the way that I've color coded the plots here, it's a little obvious just by what you're looking at, that those scarlet and gray seem to differentiate themselves clearly. But uh, the R package SLGF will consider all the possible ways that you could partition those. It'll consider all the possible color codings that you could have for those levels of the categorical predictor. It also will have to consider, well, what's the most reasonable model specification? Um, you know, should you incorporate all of the predictors in the model or should you incorporate just the group effect? 
or should you incorporate every of the, one of the variables that you're considering? So that's where the model selection part comes into play, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning. So here now is what your output will look like. I'll show you in a moment how you would actually run this, this code in the R package itself, but this would be the output that we would see from that breaking strength data set. So uh, that, that scatter plot where we had the three levels starch of the starch. So you'll get your output that looks like this. It'll summarize for each model you've specified, the grouping scheme you specified. Uh, these, it'll tell you the most probable models in order. So the most probable model based on that data set has the strength as a function of a group by film interaction. So that asterisk symbol there in between the group and the film effect is how you specify a statistical interaction in R. So it tells you what the most probable model was. And then it tells you after that, the scheme along with it. So the scheme that I have there is the way I had it color coded. It has corn in its own group and it has canna and potato in their own group. And then it tells you after that, that we have heteroscedasticity, meaning we have different error variances between the scarlet and gray groups. And then it gives you a posterior model probability after that. So then it will tell you the next most probable model. And so it's the same model, strength by group plus film. So now we're missing the interaction. It's just group plus film instead of group by film. Uh, but notice the scheme is also different in the second most probable model. It's also plausible that potato forms its own group with its own error variance, and the canna and corn are in their own group with their own error variance. So that would be color coded differently than the plots you already saw before. And then there's a posterior model probability associated with it. And then there's three more models. Uh, these are just the top five that all have different schemes. You can see model four has no scheme. So it also considers just the typical approach that you would usually do. You know, that's a plausible model as well with homoscedastic error variance, meaning just one single error variance across the board for all of your observations. So this is what the output looks like. Um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of, I had, to, I had to cut a lot of math and stats out of this. What is Bayes' theorem? I'll give you a little bit of the mathematical background here. Bayes' theorem, the wonderful thing about it is that you take a conditional probability, the probability of event A conditioned on B, you can express it as a function the other way around of the probability of B conditional on A. So Bayes' theorem allows you to take two events, one occurring and one conditionally, and expressing it as a probability of the other one conditionally happening. And so the reason that that's important in Bayesian model selection is it allows you to express the probability of a model conditional on your data when you can compute the much easier thing to find the probability of your data conditional on your model. So there's three main mathematical components to this. There's the likelihood function, which is the joint probability of your data given the model and your underlying parameters. You have your prior distribution, which represents your prior beliefs about the unknown model. And my R package SLGF here gives you two options to specify the priors on your model. And uh, then there's also the posterior distribution. So the posterior, what it does basically is you take your prior beliefs about your data, you incorporate the information that your data gives you, what it tells you about uh, the actual trends you have, and you combine those two things together and you get your posterior belief about the model that you have. And sometimes your data is, uh, not very compatible with your prior beliefs. Your prior beliefs weren't very right. And so your likelihood will update that and give you a posterior that is more indicative of the truth. So uh, I, it looks like I have time to give you one of these illustrations here then. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we have our continuous response olfactory function on the y-axis and the independent factor age category on the x-axis. So what the R package will do then is it will analyze some model specifications that the user can tailor. So you can specify, maybe we just want OLF tilde one, which is what how you would just fit a single mean effect for all your levels. And we can consider that with one or two error variances, or you wanna fit the, the typical models that I have there in lines three and four, where you have a distinct effect for each of your levels of the age category, or you can fit a group effect where you have a single mean for the red group, and a single mean for the gray group. So that would be a more simple model. And so it will analyze all 62 of those models and compute a posterior model probability for each one. And you can see overwhelmingly the two most probable models in this data set partition the scarlet and gray groups the way I have them here with four and five in one group, one, two, and three in another group, 
with two different error variances. It's just a question of do we need a different mean for each effect or do we need two means only for the red and gray groups? So if you, uh, I see I'm out of time. So uh, if you have, there's uh, more examples in the slides. I didn't expect to get to all of these, but there's more examples of how you would specify models in the slides if you want to look here. But the other quickly uh, I want to mention is if you have a data set that you feel would exhibit this, uh, this trend that I've described here today, please reach out to me because it'll be on CRAN soon and I want as many examples of this as I can find that I can use as illustrations and to help you analyze your data. So thank you. Uh, and if there are questions, I'm, uh, take that now. All right, thanks so much, Thomas. That was great. Uh, it's very ambitious to, to teach everyone Bayes' rule, so thank you very much. Um, <laughs> just, oh man, you should have seen the slides I took out. There was yes, way more to it. Very service to the community. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, so we have some various questions. Let me see if I can try and... Um, so one is, so you showed like a lot of linear regression. Can you do this with other kind of models, like generalized linear models, that sort of thing? What What is sort of the input? What kind of models? So right now, the input is just a linear model with a normally distributed error variance, the kind of thing that you would use with LM. You are 100% right that theoretically, yeah, you could do this with a GLM as well. And that is a project for another day. It's on my, it's on my radar of the way I want to incorporate this. It would just be a coding problem from there because the theory is pretty much the same. Got it. Okay. Um... Our next question here, how do you go about selecting an appropriate value for the prior of the model? Uh, great question. So we give you two options for, uh, the, for the prior, either a flat prior or a non-informative prior. That's where you're just saying, I really don't know anything about what my regression effects should be. And that's what we prefer because that's the best way to not incorporate your prior beliefs as a bias into your model. However, specifically for that dog's example, because there's so little data, there's only 12 observations, we use a different prior, what's called an informative prior, that uh, allows you to, take, to estimate a couple more effects than you ordinarily would be because of the limitations on the data. There are many, many different priors that you can put on regression effects that I didn't use in this R package. Those are just two that we have for this one. Great. And then so trying to summarize a couple different questions. So a lot of questions about like the posterior probabilities that you have for those models. How do you deal with overfitting or having too many, uh, if you put in a whole bunch of cat variables, like if you had like 10 variables, is it, do you penalize ones that use more variables, that sort of thing? Yeah, I, boy, these are excellent questions. Yeah, um, so that fractional marginal model probability, you know, the way that number is computed is there's a lot of math and calculus that goes into that. It's a couple chapters in my dissertation. So the expressions that compute those probabilities all incorporate the dimensionality of the effects that you're putting in there. So a penalty for complexity is automatically incorporated into that, into that um, computation. Great question. Okay, so we'll stop the live questions there, uh, Thomas. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, thank you. Our co-organizer, Bernie, will email you with um, the, all the questions um, and you can uh, decide how you'd like to answer them. Um, and so um, I'm gonna start getting uh, Erica set up our next 